All right, good to see everybody tonight. We're going to need y'all to sing good and loud. So let's stand together tonight. Let's sing, Bless the Lord, O my soul, all that's within me. And let's lift up His name as we worship together tonight. Turn it back to your seat. So sing on that next verse tonight.
Father, tonight we do stand in awe of a holy God, as we all should. Tonight we uh, just thank you for loving us and being the great God that you are. Thank you for this church that we could be a part of to worship together. So we ask tonight that you would be glorified and that we will do as the song said, praise the Lord for the great things you've done. So bless us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Good evening, everybody. Good to see each and every one of you here. Thank you for making church a priority on this Sunday evening. If you're joining us online, we do hope that you'll make it your goal to be with us in person as soon as you are able. Uh, in terms of announcements uh, and prayer requests, uh, do pray for Parker, Nicole, and Evelyn Roberts as they uh, look to transitioning time here from Troy, Alabama to Baxley, Georgia. Of course, the announcements have been given and the sign-up sheets out front. If your Sunday school class or family or just an individual wants to shower them with a gift card to a local merchant, uh, we, we do ask that you'll sign there just to kind of let people know what you're buying so we don't end up with 12 uh, cards to, to one place or whatever, uh, just to kind of communicate what you're giving them. So talk with your groups, talk with your family or think about yourself, how you might shower them with gift cards uh, to the local merchants. And pray for them as they will be moving. Uh, there'll Some men from the church will be going Friday to help him bring some stuff over uh, this coming weekend. And of course, that first Sunday in May, next Sunday, uh, we're looking forward uh, to him being with us for his first Sunday. So we want to be praying for Brother Parker and his family, as well as the seniors, as that night, uh, that Sunday night, uh, we'll have our senior recognition service followed by a finger food fellowship and the gift tables and everything will be set up in the gym. So make your plans to be here uh, in attendance for that. Older youth, please continue to sign up with Brother Adam uh, for summer camp. That will be at Epworth on uh, June 7th through the 10th. And then remember the dates for VBS uh, will be uh, June 12th through the 15th. And then uh, also be praying for that week as well as we'll have a couple of folks from Mount Vernon going to the Southern Baptist Convention with Brother Parker uh, in the earlier part of that week in New Orleans. So we want to pray for them, safe travels for them uh, as they go and as they come back. And I do know that Brother Parker's excited about going to that conference and then coming back to be with us for the end of VBS. And so uh, be in prayer for those things as well. Uh, women in the women's ministry, M&M's halftime refresher will be May 1st. Please see the bulletin for more information regarding that. And I, Camden, it just seems like you just keep getting, where are you at? Oh, over here. Faster and faster. He just, uh, we celebrate uh, with him uh, being named, uh, let's see, 912 Sports uh, Player of the Year for track and field. So he's recognized, but don't count Harrison out uh, in track and field area because he's, uh, if I understand correct, you've recently won the district for 14 new boys uh, for shot put and discus. And when it comes to discus, all I could discuss discus is how, how good you are at throwing that stuff. So uh, good job there. But God, I, I got to thinking about that and talking with uh, Adam. I know Presley's been recognized for soccer. Uh, we're proud of so many. If I started to name everybody, y'all, I'd leave somebody out. And so I, all I can say is we're blessed at this church to have so many young people involved in the extracurriculars. And what makes me even happier is unless they got me fooled, they all shine the light of Jesus. And so I'm, I'm more proud of that than any medal or, or any reward that they could receive because they're, uh, they're giving the glory to the Lord. And so uh, encourage our young folks. Let's leave it at that. Uh, prayer concerns. We do want to lift up the Laurie Hires family. This is Miss Tootsie's mother. Uh, pray for them in, in the wake of her passing and, and uh, make your plans to support them in uh, the visitation, uh, which will be Tuesday evening from 5 to 7 at Reinhardt Funeral Home in Jessup. And then the funeral is uh, going to be Wednesday at 11 a.m. And that'll be over in Wayne County at Autumn Hall Baptist Church. And so uh, praise the Lord for good surgery and pray for recovery and recuperation for Eddie uh, Carter as he's recovering from quadruple bypass surgery. And then another name that was mentioned uh, this morning, Marie Davis's Aunt Nell fell and has got a broken pelvis. 
And so we do want to pray for her during this time, as well as Miss Susan, who's traveling to Texas. They're probably, I guess they're already there. Uh, but uh, over in Texas, as our brother James Dollar, uh, he'll be there for surgery. And then we also want to continue to pray for Matt, Matthew Hayes uh, as he recovers and recuperates following a, a significant back injury. And so lift these folks up. I know that there are others, but I trust that you'll continue to pray for one another. And we're going to pray at this time and turn it back over to Brother Jonathan. Lord, we thank you for this night. Thank you for another opportunity to come together uh, as a church family to sing praises to your name and to hear your word proclaimed, Lord. Uh, we pray that you'll be with Brother Steve tonight as he brings your uh, message. God, I just pray that you would give us open ears and soft hearts for what you would have in store for us uh, from the preaching of your word. Uh, we are very excited, Lord, about all the things that we have going on here in the life of our church family. Uh, as we head into the summer, I pray that you'll be with the youth program and the younger youth program uh, and, and the things that we're looking forward to, God, as we approach those dates. I just pray that you'd go before us and that you'd prepare the way for young hearts to be uh, reached and, and for your word to be proclaimed and lives to be changed, Lord. Uh, we do pray for Brother Parker and his family as they begin this transitional time in their life. I uh, pray that you would help him to hit the ground running, that you'd help us to be a church that is supportive of him uh, as he begins his ministry, Lord. And we just give you all the praise and honor and glory for it all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand again tonight. Blessed be your name. And all that we do, let's be a blessing and lift him up in what we're here to do. Praise his name. Away. 
save but you alone you alone tonight we give praise and we give back tonight these times and offerings in jesus name amen let's sing it one more time tonight your name is a strong and mighty tower your name is a shelter like no other your name let the nation sing it loud Nothing has the power to save but your name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Tonight, uh, Brother Steve's going to come in just a minute, but I want to do something a little bit off the cuff uh, as we're uh, just propose, pro approaching something here. Um, guys, uh, if I think about it long enough, it blows my mind, and I've been here for 25 years. But next Sunday, we're going to do something we haven't, this church has not done in 40 years. 40 
years, which is almost unheard of. It really is, that we're going to officially have a new pastor. And, and again, I think of Brother Rick like a pastor. We all know that Brother Rick was here temporary. We knew that. He knew that. He's been here pastor. And Brother Parker starting as our pastor for the first time. This church will have a new pastor in 40, almost 40 years, which is amazing. And uh, I would just like us, before Brother Steve comes, if that's all right with you, brother, just to have a quick time of prayer. And I'd invite you to just come to the altar if you're willing real quick, and I'm going to call on just somebody to pray for us real quick, so I think it would do us a lot of good if we would do that, and uh, let's just pray for him. If you come to the altar, if you can, or you can pray right where you're at, and let's just spend a moment and lift him up in prayer before Brother Steve comes tonight, and uh, let's just pray that God will give him peace, direction. Let's pray as Rusty said this morning that we'll be a church that's unified, that he can come to, um, that's prepared to uh, work with him to serve the Lord. I'm going to pray, and then, uh, I, I, Cole, I'd like you to pray, and then, um, Brother Stephen, would you close us after Cole prays? Lord, we just come to you tonight. We just thank you for Mount Vernon Church. Thank you for the history of this church, that it's been faithful to serve you. Lord, there's not many churches, and we don't say that bragging. We just say that with praise to you, that we've not had to look for a pastor in almost 40 years. What a blessing. And we begin a new era. But, Lord, things don't change. We still stand upon the Word of God and what it says, and we thank you for Parker and his faithfulness to your Word of God. We pray for him that you'd calm any nerves, any apprehensions that he has. Give him a clear mind. Bless him and uh, Nicole and Evelyn in a special way that they'll be blessed to be a part of this community as much as we have been. And may you use them in a mighty way to serve here at Mount Vernon Church. In Jesus' name.
I don't want to fall from up here. The water, the water. Water. Thank you, brother. You won't lose your reward. Amen. I got back from Kingsland this afternoon, and my wife had lunch ready, and after we got through eating, she asked me if I was going to take a nap and rest today. I said, no, I, I don't think so. I've, uh, I've got too many notes. I'm going to have to shorten my message down, so I need some time to do that this afternoon. So in the process of shortening my message down, I've added a lot more to it. I'm sorry, but uh, that's the way it goes sometimes. Uh, indeed, I am thankful that Brother Rick has asked me to uh, fill this pulpit several times while he's been away during the interim period. And now during this final transitional service, if you will, before next Sunday when Brother uh, Parker comes, uh, I had some things on my mind I do want to share with you all, so I hope you brought your sandwich with you. Uh, maybe it won't be quite that bad, but sit, certainly sit with me for a little while. Uh, also, I want to just say personally that I'm very thankful for the fellowship I've had with Brother Rick over these last 21 months. And to reiterate some of the things that Jonathan has already said, it's hard to believe that it's been now been two years since Brother Darrell announced his resignation and, re and retirement from the ministry. And then 21 months that Brother Rick was with you all, and now just a few months after that, uh, Brother Darrell no longer shouted glory in the pew, he shouted it in the portals of glory. And uh, we, we miss him, he was a great neighbor uh, to us. A lot of encouragement, just as Brother Rick has been as well. They've been great friends and a great encouragement to our family. Very much appreciate them. And if you would this evening, I'd love for you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation chapter 3. And if you don't have a copy of God's Word, reach in the pew in front of you, get out the Gideon's Bible, and it's on page 1231. And just so that all of you will have an opportunity, I'm thankful for the screen and uh, the verses up there, but also if you could follow along in your copy of God's Word, I believe would be greatly beneficial for you. Now as you're turning, I don't have a catchy title like I did a few weeks ago on Wednesday night when I said, thank God for men like her. And everybody just wondered, what on earth are you talking about? Go home and read Exodus 17 tonight, and you can find out about her. And, uh, and I hope and pray that y'all will be an Aaron and her to your new pastor, Exodus chapter 17. But as we th start thinking about this time tonight, this transition arriving this week, I couldn't help but to believe that the Lord would have us to come to this passage of Scripture as He addresses the church with the open door. I feel like that's where Mount Vernon is tonight, as the door is wide open for what lies ahead for it. And if you can follow along with me, I want to address that. But first of all, the reading of God's Word, Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. And here the Word of God says this, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David, he that opens and no man shuts, and shuts and no man opens. I know thy works, Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcomes will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. And may the Lord add his blessing upon the reading and the proclaiming of his word this evening. As we look at this passage of scripture, the city, the church that is in Philadelphia, 
I think it would be helpful for us to understand a few things historically about the ancient city of Philadelphia. And as you start thinking in this term, I want to remind us that all seven of these churches are real churches that existed at the end of the first century A.D. Actually, they were established from Paul's successful ministry in Ephesus three and a half years that he was there, which would have been about 40 years earlier. So you have a period of time from about A.D. 55 to 95 when Revelation was written that these churches that we read about were being established and they grew, they prospered, some with great success, others with tremendous difficulty, and others that had gotten off track all within a 40-year period of time. Uh, I believe personally that these churches represent or are representative of all kinds of churches until the Lord comes throughout the church age. Uh, they give us a complete picture. You'll have some churches that really love God and they're on fire for the Lord. And in other churches that they love God, they love His Word, but boy, they're lacking in love. You got other churches that tolerate about anything that come in the door. And we have that going on today. And I think in many ways they're representative of all seven. Now I will say that there are those who say that these seven churches represent seven ages or stages of the church age. That may or may not be true also, but as you get to studying it, I think there's a little bit of credibility to that because uh, as you read and study this, you'll understand that every church period of time over these last 1990 years since the beginning of the church that you will have had different seasons of churches that have reflected some of the things you read about here. Now, I'll just let that be as it may. This is not an eschatology class tonight. But I do think it's helpful for us to remember that this is a real church that existed in the first century A.D. that the Lord of the church is writing to that church and giving them some instructions and some encouragement. And it is the church of the open door. The city of Philadelphia was situated on the Cogamus River. It was a tributary of the Hermas. It stretches out over a wide, broad valley, and due to the volcanic activity that had been in that area, it was a very fertile plain known for growing grapes and a very rich in agriculture even in that day. The city of Philadelphia was the center of the worship of the god Dionysius, the goddess of wine and fertility. And as you think about the ancient cities, this city, like all the others, was heaped in the worship of false gods and goddesses. Philadelphia was also known as the gateway to the east, a prosperous city, an ancient city with palaces and temples that many of them have been excavated today, and you can go online, Google it, and you can see some of the magnificent ruins that make up ancient Philadelphia. It's a strategic location. It, lay, it was in the trade route between three great countries of Asia Minor, or Eastern Asia Minor. You have My Mycia, Lydia, and Phrygia. And from the central location, it became the gateway to the east. And in doing so, it influenced the regions to the east of Philadelphia with the Greek culture, and it reached far and wide in its spread. So in one sense of the word, you might think of Philadelphia as a missionary city for the Greek culture. But God had something else in mind for that city when the gospel came to Philadelphia, and we're going to read about that in just a moment. But just a few other things that you think about. Uh, Philadelphia was on the major thoroughfare from Sardis in the northwest to Laodicea in the southeast. It was founded around 189 or 140, 138 B.C. by Attalus II Philadelphus of Pergamon. And the name of the city reflects the great love that this man had for his brother. The name literally means lover of his brother. And one of the interesting things about Philadelphia, with its great influence and prosperity... It was also often shaken by huge earthquakes. And in A.D. 17, much of the city was destroyed. Many of the people moved out of the city, lived in tents, never to run, return to rebuild the city. That same earthquake destroyed either 12 or 20 other cities in the region. Today, you would, if you wanted to go to Turkey, and this might be your next trip, Brother Joffrey and Angela, is to go to ancient Turkey and to see these seven churches. If you do, take me and Marcy with y'all, and we would appreciate it. And so Philadelphia is now known as Alishur in Turkey. So if you need to know where it is, that's where it is. So it is a real city, and it was in the context of that city that Christ addresses this church, and I want you to look at verse 7 again, 
where it says these words, These things saith he that is holy. As you look at this and start thinking about the Christ of the church, we've looked at the city. Now we're going to look at Christ of the church. And notice he first of all addresses himself as he that is holy. I want you to just stop a moment and let that sink in. Christ is holy. He is the Holy One of, 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 of Israel, and He is presenting Himself to the Philadelphians as a reminder that as their Savior, and I believe this is very true, as He is holy, He expects His followers to be holy also. We are to be a holy, redeemed people of God. The word holy carries the idea of being set apart or sanctified. We are set apart from the world and set apart unto Christ our Lord and Savior. So here he stands there as the Holy One of Israel. As a matter of fact, these words are Old Testament words that give us a description and a designation of God's character uh, all in one referring to Jesus Christ. For instance, in Leviticus chapter 11, verses 44 through 45, here the word, is give, the word of the Lord has given us this. He says, For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am holy. That is what God said. He wanted his people, Israel, in the wilderness to be a holy people. Why? Because he is holy. Remember, God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Christ, who is holy, who's God incarnate, God in the flesh, gave himself for us on the cross, is reminding us that just as he is holy... He expects us as his people also to be holy even in the world in which we live. You remember Isaiah chapter 6 where he goes there into the temple on the Lord's day and he was moved as the door of the temple shook and the angels uh, circling the throne, they cried out, Holy, 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 the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of the holiness, the glory of God. Jesus stands before the church, the Holy One of Israel. And again in Isaiah 40 and verse 25, God refers to himself as the Holy One. Now as you pause and think about that for just a moment, Christ, God incarnate in the flesh, is presenting himself to the church as the Holy One of Israel. Just a couple of other New Testament passages. One is in Mark 1 verses 23 through 24. I'll just give you a little bit of synopsis of what's going on here. Jesus is going about, he's preaching the gospel. He comes up on this man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. He was demonically possessed. And when the demons saw Jesus, this is what they said. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. If the demons can recognize Christ as being holy, shouldn't we as God's people honor Christ as holy? And shouldn't our lives also reflect the holiness of God in our lives as much as possible? In other words, Jesus didn't save us to keep living in sin. He saved us to be set apart unto our Savior. And just as He is holy, we too are to be holy people of God. And that's what Peter said in 1 Peter 1, verses 15 through 16. This is what the word of the Lord says. But as he who has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Dear friends, that means as God's people, as a believer in Christ, saved by his grace and mercy, positionally we are the holy people of God. But practically, we need to follow that through in our daily lives as being holy, separated unto God. Does that mean we'll never sin? No, we, we will. We, you know, you probably will, might get mad at your spouse and tell them a thing or two. You might cut somebody off on the highway. You might even have a bad thought that came out of nowhere. We are battling sin every day. But the child of God should always have this disposition That if there's one thing in my life, I want to reflect the glory and the holiness of God in my life because I identify with Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And as He is holy, I'm going to do everything in my life to be holy too. That comes with attitude as well as action. 
Some people are convinced that they're holy because they don't do anything outwardly sinful, but inwardly we studied Matthew 23 this morning, Sunday school. What did Jesus say in Matthew 23 to the Pharisees, the hypocrites? And he said, you're full of dead men's bones. You want the outside to look good and clean, but inside you're full of wickedness and lies and deceit. And Jesus is calling his people even today to be the holy people of God. We should live in stark contrast unto the ungodliness of this world. Uh, Dear friends, if we want to be identified with the Savior, be identified with the Savior. And don't leave doubt in people's minds as to whether or not you're saved, child of God. Could I get an amen on that? that? Dear friends, we need to be the holy people of God. I want you to think about something this church for just a moment. As you look at this church, and he's saying, these things saith he that is holy. That will be a good opportunity for Christ to come in the picture then and say, but I see what you're doing. I see how you're living. He doesn't do that. Out of all the seven churches, only Smyrna and Philadelphia did not receive any word of condemnation from Christ. So here's the Holy One of Israel. He looks at them and he says, I know thy works. And he approved of them as a body of Christ. What a testimony that is. To think that Christ would look at that church who is holy and yet at the same time has nothing to say in a, in a, uh, in a corrective fashion to that church. I don't know about y'all, but I would love to be that kind of a church. I'd love to be that kind of a Christian where if Christ looked at me, he would have nothing to say to correct me, but only to commend me in my walk with the Lord. Holiness is what we should strive for. But also notice something else that he says here, that he that is true. Contrast with humanity, he is not fake. Jesus is the true one. I love reading from John chapter 1 where it tells us of Christ. And when they beheld Christ in John 1, they said that he was full of grace and truth. We're living in an age where all we want is grace and no truth. And if it's all about grace and no truth, we begin to have a licentious lifestyle to do whatever we please. We've got to have grace corrected and tempered with truth. But again, if it's all about truth and we never display grace, we become legalistic and there's no joy, there's no happiness in the Lord. Jesus was the perfect embodiment of both. Grace and truth, he was the Holy One. And so when you think about this, he was not fake. He was the true deal. Holy and true is Jesus. But also notice something else here in verse 7, that he has the key of David. He has the key of David. And he is the one who opens and no man shuts and shuts and no man opens. If you'll turn back one page in your copy of God's Word to Revelation 1, I want you to notice what Jesus said here in verse 18. Revelation 1 and verse 18. He said, I am he that lives and was dead. Behold, I am alive and forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Notice that he has the keys of hell and death. I find it interesting that Jesus did not use that in reference to himself when he talks about the keys. He's already talked about having the keys of hell and death, and if you look at all seven of these churches, he uses something from chapter 1 into chapters 2 and 3 that highlight this characteristic of him. This time he doesn't do that. As a matter of fact, he goes back to the Old Testament in Isaiah, chapter 22 and verse 22, Where Elikam, in the days of Hezekiah, he became the treasurer of King David's coffers. And this is what it was said about Elikam. It says, In the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. You see what Christ has done? It not only shows us that he's the Lord of the church, he goes back to the Old Testament and shows us that he's the Lord of David's house. Perhaps, 
This is in stark contrast to verse 9 where Jesus refers to the synagogue. The synagogues were where the Jews worshipped and they were the gatekeepers of the things of Israel and in this case, the house of David. But it's sort of like Jesus stands before them and he says this, that I am the one that has the key to the house of David. You've ran the Christians out from the synagogue because you've said they're not Jews, but I've got news for you. I've got the key to the house of David. And it's because I have the key of the house of David, I will determine who comes into my house and who goes out of my house. I will determine who the door is open unto, and I will determine who the door is closed to. I have the keys. He has the keys of hell and death. He also has the key of David. And as you look at this and think about it, it gives us the idea that he has total authority. He has total authority, Revelation 1.18, over death, hell, and the grave. Uh, Isaiah 22, Psalm, uh, Revelation 3, that he has the key of the house of David. He is Lord of all. He is Lord of all. And no one will ever take the keys away from him. And when we think about this, this is the Lord that we serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, apparently the Jews had closed the door, but he wanted to make it clear that he not only was the door, he opens the door, he's got the key to do so. And now he addresses the church then in verse, <clears throat> beginning in verse 8. Notice what he says, I know thy works. Just ponder that for a moment. Christ saw the works of the Sardis church. They had a name that they were alive. And Jesus said that they were dead. As a matter of fact, they didn't even know they were dead. They were a dead church. They were going through all the motions. They, they were doing all these things, but yet when Christ looked at them, he saw that their works were not perfect before God. But then when we look here at the church in Philadelphia, he says, I know thy works. And because of your faithfulness, and I know your works, I have now set before you an open door. No man can shut it. Thou hast a little strength. You've kept my word and have not denied my name. When we think about this and we see the church at Philadelphia, these churches, as well as Smyrna, were a lot of pressure and persecution from the community in which they were. As a matter of fact, if you'll turn back again one page to Revelation 2 for just a moment, notice what Jesus said here in Revelation 2 in regards to Smyrna. And this is what he said to them in verse 9, I know thy works, tribulation, poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. You notice in both of these, when Jesus referred to the Jews, in the city where the Christians were being persecuted, he referred to the synagogue as the house of Satan. They were false. They were not the true representative of Israel. And he said, they are of the synagogue of Satan. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't read How to Win Friends and Influence People? Uh, you, you, he missed that chapter, amen? He told it like it was, that they were of the house and the synagogue of Satan. I find it interesting, and you think about this, that in both of these churches, that Christ did not have any words of correction for were also the churches that were being persecuted. I think there's something to be said about that. I've heard it said years past that the church always thrives under persecution, but it fails prosperity every time. As a matter of fact, in Laodicea, when you get there, and we're not going to, trust me, we won't get into Laodicea tonight, I promise. But when you look at Laodicea, they had everything that they needed. They were wealthy. They had medicine. They had everything that they needed, and yet Christ said that you don't even know that you're blind and naked. They had some of the best wool there could have been. They had eye salve to help to anoint eyes to keep, prevent blindness. They had everything that they needed but the one thing they needed and that was Christ on the inside of the church with them. Instead, they had shut the door and he was knocking at the door to get in. Here Christ is saying to them, I know your works and because of your works, because of your faithfulness, 
I have set before you an open door, an open door that is now before you that no one will shut, no one, um, uh, that no one will shut. <clears throat> so as you think about this word for open door, I want to give you just two implications for it. One I think is perhaps, and it, there, there are strong support for both of these opinions, that this refers an open door into heaven. In other words, the Jews have kicked them out of the synagogue. They're called the, the synagogue of Satan. So now Christ is opened unto them the door into the kingdom of God. The other has often been used as ministry, missions, and outreach. I think both of those are very well implied and intended in this passage of scripture. Like I've already said, the city of Philadelphia was the gateway to the east. It spread its influence of Greek culture into the far reaches of the eastern empire. And as you think about what all is taking place here, that this was a motif that Paul often used in his life and ministry. I've got four that I wanted to read, but I'm going to shorten those out a little bit to, as, as I go through it. But you'll find Paul saying this several times in the book of Acts, how Christ had shut the door. He couldn't go into Asia to preach the gospel. He couldn't go into Bithynia or Lystra to preach the gospel. He goes down to Troas. There he has a vision. And later he said that what happened then, that God had opened the door to take the gospel into Troas, southern Europe today, Macedonia. Why? God had closed some doors, but he opened the one door God wanted him to go in. You find this all four different times in Paul's account of his three missionary journeys and his trip to Rome. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 3 is something that Paul encouraged the church at Colossae to do. And this is what he said. Pray for us that God would open us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which also I am in bonds. Pray for us. So appreciate what Brother Jonathan has done in praying already that, and as you all have been, that God would open the door for Mount Vernon Church to be an influence for the cause of Christ under the leadership of your new pastor. Folks, that's a heart cry that I believe you all have. I believe your pastor has. That God would open the door that he would have us to go through in a new legacy, in a new historical moment for the future of this church. Now, I was 37 when we moved and uh, went to Savannah, and, and boy, that was going to be the highlight of my ministry. It was almost the end of my ministry. Love the folks there, but you know how it goes sometimes. It just didn't work out that way. I still love the people at Savannah, and, and uh, every opportunity I go, I love to go back there. But sometimes God opens doors, and sometimes God shuts the door. Amen? But it seems like that to me tonight, that as we start thinking in terms of the future, of the door that God has given to Mount Vernon Church. And I would ask y'all to not miss the opportunity when he opens the door before you. Notice what he said, thou hast little strength. Thou hast a little strength. It is believed the church at Philadelphia was small in number, but they were mighty in spirit. You know, they, they, as far as the world is concerned, it just didn't add up. I read a story or an account where somebody was talking about if you lived in the first century A.D. And if you were a betting person and you wanted to bet in favor of, would it be A, the Roman Empire, or B, the church, which one would you have chosen? Well, I'll have put my money with the Roman Empire. Guess what, folks? The Roman Empire has been out of existence ever since 400 A.D. But the church still lives on, Amen. And it just shows us that God's ways are not men's ways, and men's ways are not God's ways. And what we think is small and insignificant, God has a way of using it in a mighty and powerful way if we will only allow him. Last Sunday night, I sat down with the folks at Kingsland. As you know, I go down there every Sunday and love the folks there. And last Sunday night, there were four of us, plus myself, sitting at the table, and I was sharing with them uh, the, the situation that we were in. Four people plus myself. And here is within a 15-minute drive, 
of the Kings Point Fellowship, there are 39,000 people that live there. Building apartments right and left, people coming and going. Gross Road connects Laurel Island Parkway and Highway 40. Just about a three or four mile strip, if that long, connect these two major corridors going over to the submarine base. And when I said this and I encouraged them, and even though we don't have all the answers as why things are like they are, but keep this in mind, there's 39,000 people, and I bet you not all of them go to church. As a matter of fact, 57% only claim to attend church very infrequently or not at all. And when I think about that, I think, well, what can we do? I tell you, I'm not looking necessarily at our numbers. I'm looking at my Savior who can do great and powerful things even in the small numbers. Amen? And even though the Lord has blessed this church and y'all have got many great opportunities, and I think in many ways you're not insignificant, but you are significant here in our community, in our county, but you keep recognizing Jesus Christ as the Holy One, the True One, and I guarantee you Christ will keep the door open as we're faithful to serve Him. Notice what He said, You've not denied my name. You have kept my word. I believe with all my heart that one of the reasons why Mount Vernon is such a strong church and even Affleck County is such a great county, and that is because of the belief in the Word of God. Uh, I got our Gideons to do this for me, and their uh, fiscal year goes from June through May. And this is what the report says. That their year to date in Appling County Camp of $158,353 has gone to the purchase of scriptures to be, trans to be given out all over the world. Amen. And I remember when this church voted to spend $25,000 for the purchase of the word of God so others might hear and be saved. God has a way of honoring his word. I believe our county has honored his word, but you don't understand, Brother Steve, there's a lot of stuff going on. Amen. But guess what? The church doors are still open. Amen. There's still an open door. There's still an opportunity for God to get his word out. Notice what he said. You have a little strength. You've kept my word. You've not denied my name. And because of that, I've set before you an open door. And if you'll notice here, Jesus often after this commendation uh, of them, he usually gives his condemnation. But there's no call to repentance here. He, this is just what he says. He says, because you have kept my word. And I'm going to skip over some things. But he said, because you've kept the word of my patient, patient endurance, you've kept the word. I will keep you from the hour of temptation or trial, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell therein. He that overcomes, I will give unto him the crown of life. Come, hold fast that you have, that no man take thy crown. Uh, I love that word crown. It's the Greek word Stephanos. If you wonder where the name Stephen comes from, right here, the victor's crown. Amen, Stephen? Great first name. Uh, I love it. The victor's crown. And this is what Christ is saying. He said, you're overcomers. Don't let anyone take your crown. That is to be disqualified in the race. I looked up online and checked it out. I was going to use it as an illustration. But do you realize there are a lot of gold medal winners in the Olympics that had their gold medal taken away? Why? Because they did not run the race legally and lawfully according to the rules. And their gold was taken away. Jesus says here, you hold fast what you have. No one takes your crown. Dear friends, keep on keeping on for the name of the Lord Jesus. And he promises because you have been faithful to keep my word. You've faithfully endured. I will keep you from the hour of temptation, which will come upon the whole world to try them that dwell upon the earth. He promises that these who say they're Jews are not, but are not, they'll come and they'll worship at your feet. He promises to come quickly, and he promises to give them a place 
of prominence in that new city, New Jerusalem. Notice what it says, verse 12. Him that overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He has promised that he will write their name in the temple of his God. One of the interesting things about the ancient city of Philadelphia, we do it a lot even in our day, someone does something of note and recognition, they, they might have a memorial put there in the city square, or they would have their name written on the cornerstone of a building because of a great donation maybe they had made to the erection of that building. In, in this day, in the day of the Philadelphian church, if someone in the city did something great, they would write their name on the pillars of the temples dedicated to the false gods. But you know, when the earthquake hit and those temples collapsed, so their names did also. But he promises to write their name in the temple of his God, which never fails and will never fade away. It will not fall. It is a place of permanence. It is a place of prominence where he will write their new name and not only their name in the temple, but God's name on them. Folks, that's a pretty good deal to me. And he wants us to be faithful. He's given us the open door to go forward for the cause of Jesus Christ. Now, as I get ready to close this up, and, and I just want to share a few other things with you, if you can bear with me for just a moment. Go back to verse 1 for just a minute. I'm sorry, verse 10. And notice at the end of that phrase, that he I will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. You know, when you think about it, the door is still open today. And I want to highlight, first of all, that door of salvation is still open. Aren't you thankful? To know that the Lord of the church still has the door way of salvation open to all who will come upon him, call upon him. Now when I think about this, this phrase, those which dwell upon the earth, is a phrase that is used often throughout the book of Revelation. And many times you'll find it the newer translations translated earth dwellers. It carries with it the idea that their life is all about this earth, this life only. They have no regard for God. They have no regard for heaven. They have no regard for their Savior. And so they live for this world and this world only. Earth dwellers. There's coming a day when God will bring His judgment out upon those who have rejected His Son, refused to go through the door of salvation, and He brings His judgment out upon them, the earth dwellers. And I think this is a good place to just ask ourselves a question. First of all, have I ever been through the door of salvation? Jesus said, I am the door to the sheepfold. And have you ever been through that door of salvation? Jesus is still calling today lost men and women, boys and girls to be saved, to come unto Jesus and to be saved. John wrote in 1 John chapter 2, this world is passing away in the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God abides forever. And I hope and pray that it's God's people tonight that we are setting up treasures in heaven where moth and rust does not corrupt and thieves don't break through and steal. If all our life is about this life, we've got some spiritual problems. But the door of salvation is still open to all who will call upon him. And I hope and pray that you have been. I hope and pray that you have gone through that door of salvation. And I want to just make a couple of other, a few other personal observations. I jotted this down to just kind of help me to get through it. And I said that I can't help but to believe that God has sovereignly set Mount Vernon Baptist Church, situated right here by Highway 15, the 346-mile-long Traditions Highway. You, I bet you all didn't know the name of that highway, did you? Traditions Highway. You're about four miles off of the famous Woodpecker Trail. Boy, doesn't that really get you. 
but you are right here about the middle ways of that 400, 346 mile, just as Philadelphia was between Sardis and Laodicea. God had put that church there for a purpose. I believe this church is here for a purpose as well. I believe a new open door of opportunity and ministry lies ahead of you. The door of a 38-year legacy of pastoral ministry has now been closed for two years. His legacy will live on, and rightly so, no one would ever take Brother Darrell's place. But also, you've taken 21 months in God's foyer, in, in the foyer of God's waiting room, under a greatly loved and admired interim. And I want to remind us again this evening that waiting on the Lord is still just as much a part of the work of God as going for the Lord. Sometimes he says go, sometimes he says wait. Sometimes the door is closed, sometimes the door is open. Now God has given you this open door. The holy and true one with the keys has opened a new door, a new era in the life and ministry of Brother Parker Roberts, his wife and daughter. You're under a new shepherd to shepherd the flock of God. And thank God for your prayers for him, and may you continue to do so. So as I think about that in closing, what are some open doors that are before Mount Vernon Church tonight? There is still the mission and the message and the ministry of this church that needs to be fulfilled. That is, the mission is to make disciples of all nations. I remember when Brother Parker was here and he talked about he would like to focus on discipleship. I think that is so crucial in today's world because, you know, when God calls us, there's much more to the Christian faith than just coming and warming a pew on Sundays. It's a Sunday through Sunday lifestyle to bring honor and glory to the Lord of the church. The mission of the church, make disciples. The message of the church, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The ministry of the church is still before us. Where you accomplish the mission of the church in making disciples, we do it through the ministry that God calls us to do. But also I want to remind us this evening, the ministry of the church must always be subservient to the church's mission and message. If you ever get those two turned around, where the mission begins to... Uh, where the ministry begins to drive the mission and the message, it will weaken the message and you fail to make disciples. Good case in point. When the Salvation Army began many, many years ago, it was a very bastion of the gospel message. But throughout the years, through its ministries, little by little, it's gotten off key where the message and the, men, and the, the, the mission of making disciples is not as important as the ministry of what they're doing. We always have to keep the word of God first. Notice what Jesus said. You've not denied my word. You've kept my name. I think there's open door a family ministry. We've got nurses, nursery ministry, children's ministry, youth ministry, adult ministry, women's ministry, men's ministry. And I would just challenge us even this evening as I think about next Sunday night, you're going to be celebrating 10 graduates from this church. Already you've got some young adults in their 20s, but I would ask us, you know, what do we do to minister to those who graduate from high school? Do we have to wait till they get married, have children, then come back? I think there's, the door is wide open for all kinds of ministries to effectively carry out the mission of making disciples at Mount Vernon. And it's sort of like God has said, here's the door now, go for it. And I hope and pray that you will. I, I tell you, I'm, I, I'm excited for him, and I'm not even coming to be the pastor. It's just exciting to me to think of what God can do in any church that is committed to the cause of Jesus Christ, honoring the word of God and honoring the Lord of the church, and praying for the success of the gospel of what God can do. Amen. There's the open door of evangelism, edification, education. I went in our public library the other day and I walked around. I saw absolutely nothing I wanted to read. I, I, I'm, I'm sure you find that interesting. No, I take that back. I think I did see one book. I thought I need to come back and read it. And I don't even remember what it was. You know, when I think about a min ministry of 
with all the teachers we've got here and with all the things that are going on in our world of what a great opportunity it would be to have a library that could address the issues of our day that puts the Bible in context of how we can live out the gospel in day-to-day lives. Folks, there are just all kinds of things. I, I don't know if Brother Parker's watching. Sorry, maybe this was his message next week. Maybe he can preach it again. But there's all kinds of opportunities out there for a church committed to the things of God. You know, let's be like the Red Sea that marches through on dry ground. Let's keep on, keep it on for the Lord. There's an open door of worship, work, and our witness. And also there's that open door of faithfulness until the door is shut. Remember, Jesus said, I'm the one who opens the door, and also I'm going to be the one who shuts it. God gave Noah 120 years for the building of the boat. And then God goes into the ark, and he calls Moses to come into the ark. And God shut the door. The door of salvation is still open, but there's coming a day where that door of salvation will be closed. Right now, he's given us a mission and the message Jesus saves to take it to all the world until he comes, until he shuts the door. Don't be like the ten foolish virgins on the wrong side of the door knocking, trying to get in. Be on the right side, be inside for the wedding ceremony. We come there by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And I would encourage you to pray much for your pastor. I am very thankful to be able to, hopefully I've said something that can challenge us this evening. And I know we've already gathered around the altar for a time of prayer. And maybe if you would like to again, as Brother Jonathan, our pianist gets ready for our invitation, you just left to come. And pray that God would just give you the wisdom and us the wisdom, all of us the wisdom of the doors that he would have for us. Yes, in our life there's been doors that have been shut, there have been doors that have been opened, and sometimes I just don't know what to do, okay? But you keep praying, you keep trusting, you keep plugging along. And now God has given you all an open door. Now it's an open door of the greatest opportunity perhaps that you'll ever have. So let's pray together, and then as Brother Jonathan gets ready uh, to lead us. And if you'd like to come and pray and ask God's blessing upon the future of our church, we invite you to do so. Father, thank you for your love, your goodness. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for Mount Vernon Church and how it's ministered uh, faithfully throughout the years. Lord, they have kept your word front and center. They've kept the name of Jesus high and lifted up. And now, Father, I believe that you've given them this great opportunity, a great open door into the future. And Lord, I know that none of us know what is happening, what is going on in the world, but we know that there's a place of permanency in the things of God when we trust in you and we live for you and we bring honor and glory to your name. So, Father, would you just speak to us now during this time? I know we've already come to the altar and prayed. But Father, maybe tonight is just another time that we need to come and we can't pray too much, but to just come and pray that the Lord would help us to go through those open doors of ministry that he gives us so that we might faithfully make disciples in proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ until he comes for us. So Lord, I pray now for your name to be honored and glorified during this time we pray in Christ's name and amen. Amen. Brother John. Stand together.